Kelly Ayotte and your other interests are um, not a part of our boat, speaking for myself. So please proceed, Dave. Okay. Well, you know, actually, I, I disagree because actually Kelly Ayotte is a big part of this because thanks to Councilman Pignatelli, she did question Kelly Ayotte during Kelly's nomination hearings back in, I believe, March of 2009. And she asked, or the council asked Kelly to respond to my allegations that the uh, state had not turned over the witness statement. I would disagree that this isn't pertinent and that this issue, you know, should be, should be looked at. So, so basically what I'm saying, and I'll try to wrap it up in a minute, but what you have are two cases. And if you make the effort, and I appreciate that you're going to do that, because now we're going to be able to get somewhere. You're going to get in touch with the Attorney General and you're going to find out if, in fact, there are witness statements or if, in fact, everything is fabricated, as I say. That's terrific. And then you're going to have to... Well, uh, I hope I'm fit to serve the state. And uh, if that's true, then perhaps the country won't be any worse off. Well, therein lies the rub, because as long as you continue to violate known established legal precepts like Brown versus Board of Education, when you did what you did to Ralph Holder, and as long as you allow bad cops like Martin Dunn and his lawyer, Dan Mullen, to lie about me and, and say that I was disbarred, that I had fantasies about Chief Dunn raping his daughter, and that I wrote a fraudulent letter when I was in a BLACP legal chair, you know, all these things that were false, but, you know, Chief Dunn was busy laughing about the prospect of me being gang raped in prison and you ignored that. No, as long as you continue to do those kinds of things, you're not going to be good for New Hampshire or for the country. And that's just the way it is. I mean, look what she condoned in my case. I mean, are you kidding me? Really? See, when you get up into New Hampshire, it doesn't matter how many trials you've won, or what kind of public policy you've changed in Nashua, who you've teamed with and, and done good things, or doesn't matter if you have a mayoral commendation, you're still a... Some of you are familiar with the fact that I do some blogging on New Hampshire Insider, and the thread that I'm blogging on is New Hampshire's knife on spells problems for ale. Now, one of the issues that I was going to address, and I'll thank you, Councilor Burton, for bringing it up when you had said that this is the, the people's table. You made reference to the districts representing 200,000, 250,000. People. And the people would want you to look into this matter. And what I mean by that is that you look into it to the point that we get some sort of resolution within the next week with regard to witness statements that the state has refused to turn over. Now I'll address that at the end, but I do have a prepared speech and I'll go over that and then add in a few more comments. This won't take very long. Some of you may have read a comment that I made in or after the article that was posted in the Concord Monitor of the Fourth First Woman <coughs> Chief Justice. And I made a comment that reads this way. Justice Delanus had the opportunity of two cases she reviewed shortly after the impeachment trial to show that the Attorney Discipline Office was deliberately covering up the state prosecutors who violated rules. She chose to ignore the facts and thus send the message that state prosecutors can act with impunity. The best example is now taking place in the AG's office where Attorney General Michael Delaney is refusing to leak doc release documents that would implicate numerous state prosecutors and judges at every level of a massive cover-up. The Supreme Court issued a written statement following the impeachment trial 
that would hold prosecutors and judges accountable. Linda Delanus had the opportunity <coughs> to test that statement and should be questioned by the Executive Council for refusing to do so. <coughs> a new revised code of judicial conduct emanating as a result of the impeachment trial went into effect on October 1, 2001. The pertinent code relative to today's hearing says that if a judge has knowledge that there is substantial likelihood that another judge or lawyer has violated the applicable rules, applicable rules of conduct, appropriate action is required. That appropriate action may include direct communication, other direct action if available, or reporting the violation to the appropriate authority. Just one month later, after this code went into effect, on November 22, 2001, the New Hampshire Supreme Court received a Rule 11 petition from me challenging the ruling of the Attorney Discipline Office in which the office did not find any violations of the rules of professional conduct found against two state prosecutors, including the county attorney. The central issues in the filing were that the state prosecutors aggregated their own court statements and therefore did not have witnesses to substantiate their claims. And second, that state prosecutors withheld, mischaracterized, and later destroyed exculpatory videotape evidence. Linda Delanus, along with Justice Brock, Broderick, Duggan, and Nagin, refused to overrule its attorney discipline office or it had oversight authority and therefore, therefore sent the message that these activities will be tolerated. The final ruling was on March 5, 2002. Seven months later, on October 26, 2002, the Supreme Court received a second Rule 11 petition, this time specific only to the handling of videotape. Once again, Justice Delanus, again along with Justices Brock, Broderick, Duggan, and Nato, refused to act in accordance with the revised Code of Judicial Conduct, thus once again sending the message that judges and prosecutors can act with the knowledge that they will not be held accountable when they violate the rules. The issues before Justice Delanus were so plain and simple that there could be no other conclusion that her decisions were not in the interest of law, but were made for other reasons. Without judges who are perceived and trusted by members of the public as impartial, the authority of law is compromised. You may remember that's from Chief Justice Brock relative to the Snow's case. Federal Judge Joseph LaPlante, people who have seen my comments, have mentioned repeatedly that he requested an investigation of the Attorney General's office, specifically Kelly Ayer. And what he requested was documents relative to my case, which have not shown up. Now, not to put Tom on the line, but he commented to me that he didn't have any knowledge that in the two years that the case was in the office, that the office was able to come up with any of the witness statements on notice of, of charges that should have been turned over. So that raises a giant red flag. Last week, I spoke with Laura Kiernan at the Supreme Court, and I just mentioned to her that because of the timetable, because of the rush to judgment, that it would be proper that she notify one of the delays that I would be mentioning the two cases that she had ruled upon. So I'm hoping that you had a chance to, to look at those. I did, and I'll be happy to respond to the proper time. Well, at the proper time, okay, and after all the witnesses, there's no objection from members of the council, we'll ask Justice Delanus to come back and respond to whatever she might wish to. Keep in mind, the question before the council, when the governor puts this to a vote, is the nomination of Justice Delanus and all that surrounds that. Kelly Ayotte and your other interests are um, not a part of our vote, speaking for myself. So please proceed, Dave. Okay. Well, you know, actually, I, I disagree because actually Kelly Ayotte is a big part of this because thanks to Council Dignitelli, she did question Kelly Ayotte during Kelly's nomination hearings back in, I believe, March of 2009. And she asked, or the council asked Kelly to respond to my allegations that the 
uh, state had not turned over the witness statements, and she supplied a what I often blog a 1,200 plus word long invasive email that basically implicates her in the cover up. Now, the reason I bring that up is because, again, it's, it's pertinent to the issue, and the issue is will this council represent the people, and will this council direct itself to a resolution of whether or not the state has turned over those documents? Now, when I mentioned my comment, I said the best example is that Attorney General Michael Delaney is refusing to release the documents that have implicated numerous state prosecutors. So the question that I'm asking is a very simple matter, and because this is being rushed, all I'm asking you is to resolve that question. And if that question is resolved, that no, the state has not turned over those witness documents, then the issue has to be brought up with the nominee as to why, when she reviewed the case, did she not send it back to the attorney discipline? The fact that she, she does have judicial duties and cases like this are going to come before her. The overriding point that I'm trying to make is the fact that there isn't, as I see it, or at least in the cases that I have presented to the attorney discipline office, there isn't any oversight, and that's the responsibility of the, the state Supreme Court, and that actually was delegated by the United States Supreme Court, and even to add to that is that the United States Supreme Court regards a decision by its attorney discipline office as a ruling of the court. I would disagree that this isn't pertinent, and that this issue, you know, should be, should be looked at. So, so basically what I'm saying, and I'll try to wrap it up in a minute, but what you have are two cases, and if you make the effort, and I appreciate that you're going to do that, because now we're going to be able to get somewhere, and you're going to get in touch with the Attorney General, and you're going to find out if in fact there are witness statements, or if in fact everything is fabricated, as I say. That's terrific. And then you're going to have to then weigh that response versus why or why not uh, it wasn't sent back to the Attorney Discipline Office. Because, as I said, unless you're providing proper, proper oversight, then you have these problems. And I'll repeat it again, and then I'll wrap it up. And the problem is, that's why individuals like Michael Delaney, like Attorney General Ayotte, like Peter Heed, and also uh, former Attorney General McLaughlin's name was mentioned, that's why if there's an oversight, they feel very, very comfortable <coughs> just absolutely denying a, a person's right. Now, now, the right I have are really threefold. Number one, to get the documents, go to an attorney, get back in federal court. Number two, because the rule says that if you have no information or the truth is then found, then you can go back to the attorney discipline office and ask for a rehearing, and there are eight sitting there. And number three, simply by the fact that the individuals that I just mentioned uh, haven't turned anything over, and then we're talking about uh, violations of their profession. So, I'll wrap it up with that.